Hello, I'm Frank Cullen from the Irish Historic Towns Atlas Project in the Royal Irish Academy Dublin and I'm delighted to present this piece for the Dublin Festival of History 2020. The topic of discussion is the City of Dublin as seen through the lens of the wonderfully detailed Ordnance Survey Town Plan of the City published in 1847 at a scale of 5 feet to 1 mile. This map captures the urban topography in exquisite detail, allowing a unique glimpse into the streetscape of mid-Victorian Dublin. Starting in the Eastern Ports District, before moving west to the industrial zone around Thomas Street and the Liberties, a thematic and spatial approach will be taken, discussing the geography and topography, as well as the social and economic factors that gave rise to these two very different spaces situated at the eastern and western extremities of the city. Beginning with the maritime theme, Sheet 15 depicts the port from the Custom House eastward along North Wall as far as the Royal Canal Dock and includes the City Quay and Sir John Rogerson's Quay on the South River Bank. The street names recorded on the map including Sheriff Street, Guild Street, Mayor Street and Common Street signify the connection between this part of the city and the Corporation of Dublin which was responsible for reclaiming this land from the sea in the early part of the 18th century. Let us first take a look at the magnificent Custom House, designed by James Gandon and completed in 1785. This building replaced an older structure located further up river on Essex Quay in what was once the old port. With the proposed opening of the new Carlisle Bridge in 1795, it would be necessary to move the Custom House to a new location downstream and east of the new bridge. The building, which costs £250,000, is recognised as perhaps Dublin's finest 18th century neoclassical public building. The south front facing the river is the grandest, with its magnificent portico visible on the map. The man responsible for having the Custom House moved downstream was John Beresford. He was appointed Commissioner of the Revenue in 1770 and this appointment was instrumental to the future planning and development of the Port District and the wider city as he was also a member of the Wide Street Commissioners. His name is commemorated in Beresford Place which originally formed a crescent of elegant Georgian houses around the north front of the Custom House. The map shows that by 1847 only those to the west remained, the east side giving way to the old tobacco stores and warehouses. The Loop Line Railway was responsible for the demolition of the west side in the 1880s and today only the central block remains. This however contained the finest houses and was built especially for Beresford by Gandon. The old dock immediately east of the Custom House was filled in to make way for further warehousing in 1927. The Custom House building was the centrepiece of the wider Custom House complex, which extended eastward along North Wall as far as Common Street. Contained within a high security wall depicted on the map, it included sugar and tobacco stores, a large timber yard, a whisky store and cooperage, and the new George's Dock and Inner Dock. Remarkably, all of these features were constructed in the four year period from 1820 to 1824, and the majority by one man, the engineer John Rennie. The presence of these buildings hint towards the large sugar refining and distilling industry prevalent in the city during the 19th century and reflects an important codependency between the eastern maritime and the western industrial zone, a point we will touch upon later. Much of the activity of loading and unloading vessels occurred in the smaller George's Dock, surrounded on the map by cranes and weighing machines while the larger inner dock was used mostly for mooring. Since entry to each dock was via a narrow lock, 
They began to become obsolete by mid-century, as the modern steamships were too large to enter, and instead moored along the quay walls opposite the shipping agents and ticketing offices. The building housing the tea store and tobacco store, immediately east of the smaller dock, still stands today and has been reworked as a modern mall now housing the Irish Emigration Museum. Known today as the CHQ or Chick Building, but originally a Stack A warehouse, it was used in 1856 to host an enormous banquet in honour of the Irish regiments that fought in the Crimean War. Over 4,500 people attended to this event, and this was the only building in the city deemed large enough to accommodate such a crowd. Along the quayside, opposite the steam packet stores, we see a wooden wharf labelled on the map, a reminder of the endless difficulties the port authorities experienced in attempting to provide deep water berthage for the large steamships belonging to the City of Dublin and the British and Irish steam packet companies now lining the quays. Wooden wharfs, advancing into the river away from the shallow quay wall, was suggested as a cost-effective solution by the English engineer Sir William Cubitt when consulted in the 1840s. In 1847, land to the east of the Royal Canal Dock was as yet underdeveloped. This would change dramatically over the next 30 years as the port industrialised. At the eastern extremity along East Wall, we see a patent slip depicted on the map. This denotes ship repairing and maintenance, and a traditional boat building industry had existed in Ring's End since the 18th century. Evidence of this is visible on the map in the form of the small ship builder's yard, shown next to Grand Canal Dock. Most of the shipping facilities, as we've seen, were located on the north bank of the Liffey, along the north wall and Custom House Quay. On the south side of the river, along Sir John Rogerson's Quay, other interesting facets of this maritime community are depicted on the map. Facing the river between Lime Street and Cardiff's Lane, we see the Hibernian Marine School, which was established by Parliamentary Grant in 1775 to provide maintenance, education and apprenticeships for the children of seamen. The building, depicted on the map, survived intact until 1979 when it was demolished to make way for offices. Conspicuous in this extract are the large circular tanks of the expansive Dublin Alliance Gas Company works, stretching from the riverfront back as far as Great Brunswick, now Pier Street. Immediately east of the school, we see a dense block which in 1847 contained a conglomeration of small businesses including provision dealers, grocers, spirit merchants, dairy yards, an oyster factory, a rope and sail manufacturer and a number of shipping agents and brokers. With such a large seafaring community living and working in the area, the Mariner's Church on Forbes Street performed the necessary function. The church, established in 1832 at a cost of £2,000, in addition to providing Sunday services, also held midweek lectures with accommodation for up to 500 people. If we look back upon its history, however, we unearth a rather colourful past. It was built to replace the Episcopal Floating Chapel, which had been moored in the nearby Grand Canal Basin since 1822. Such vessels, intended to administer to the spiritual needs of the seafaring community, were commonplace in the ports of larger towns, with Belfast, Liverpool and London also laying claim to their own floating chapels. Moving west now, we cross the city to examine the southeastern suburb, sorry, the southwestern suburb of St. Catherine's Parish and the Liberties. Here we encounter a very different landscape in the form of a dense industrial zone stretching westward along Thomas Street and James Street as far as Bow Bridge in Kilmainham. The presence of water in the area from the rivers Liffey, Poddle and Camac, and also the Grand Canal Harbour and City Basin help explain the origins of this western suburb as a centre of industry. 
By 1847, the puddle was unrecognisable from its original course, and the map shows a complex network of channels and tributaries above and below the surface, forming mill ponds and races with sluice gates, all drawing from the puddle source. The presence of this river, therefore, was vital for powering the mills and supplying the factories, breweries and distilleries across the entire Liberties district. The Warrenmount Mills and Chemical Works, south of Newmarket, provide an excellent example. With the Poddle Mill Race and Pond driving the Flour and Oil Mill before continuing eastward under Black Pits to supply the nearby Busby's Distillery at Fumbley's Lane. And in the process, giving name to the nearby street New Row on the Poddle, which eventually became New Row. Weaver Square and Tenter Lane, in close proximity to Warrenmount, serve as reminders of the once great textile industry that flourished here in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, its Huguenot origins commemorated in the nearby Dufour Court. With the advent of steam power in the mid-19th century, riverside locations with mill ponds and mill races became less strategic and steam mills and factories began to open in other parts of the city. This practice increased after 1867 with the opening of the new Corporation Waterworks. In 1847, however, the Liberty's water supply fell outside the jurisdiction of Dublin Corporation and had not yet transitioned from the older system of wooden pipes to metal pipes. This is demonstrated around the Newmarket and Coombe district, where we see wooden pipes labelled on the map. In this southwest corner of the city, we can count nine breweries and five distilleries on the 1847 map. Among the larger breweries were Watkins on both sides of our D Street, the site dating back to the late 16th century, Sweetman's on Francis Street. Guinness at James's Gate, Darcy's Anchor Brewery on Usher Street and the Phoenix Brewery on Watling Street, later taken over by Daniel O'Connell Jr. This reflects a growing market where consumption almost trebled between 1847 and 1868 following a shift from spirits to beer in the wake of the temperance campaign of the 1840s and government taxation on spirits in the 1850s. Much of the beer brewed in Dublin was transported along the Liffey to the port for exportation to Britain, while beer destined for the rest of Ireland was dispatched from the nearby Grand Canal Harbour, where Guinness had its own private basin. The meteoric rise of the Guinness Brewery in the second half of the 19th century ensured the decline and disappearance of all of its competitors by the mid-20th century, the most dramatic casualty being the Sweetman Brewery purchased by the Guinnesses in 1895, only to be demolished to make way for the Ivy Market in 1900. The scale of the Guinness operation by the end of the 19th century, with the shipping and bottling of the product, gave rise to increased employment opportunities in the Eastern Port District and the glass works at Rings End. In addition to Busby's distillery at Fumbley's Lane, other distilleries of note included George Rowe of Bonham Street, Powers of John's Lane West, Jameson and Robertson of Marabone Lane, and the Bow Lane Distillery in Kilmainham. By the 1880s, the Rowe Distillery would become the largest in the city, having invested £70,000 in expanding its premises to create an output of 2 million gallons per year. Although this suggests a buoyant market, it was anything but buoyant due to the catastrophic damage caused by the temperance movement and increased taxation. To combat this, Dublin distillers looked to the English market and for a time shipped most of their product through Dublin port until the Irish market recovered in the 1880s. Other large industrial premises of note on the map include James Haig's foundry at RD Street, the Union Iron Works at School Street and the large Vitriol Works at Cook's Lane off Watling Street. 
The map also gives subtle clues to other industrial activities, with rope walks depicted at Brown Street and Grand Canal Harbour, the latter becoming the present-day Brandon Terrace. Tan yards abound in this area in the 19th century, not always shown on the map. However, those in Cook Street, Watling Street and Pigtown Lane are depicted, the latter name inspired no doubt by the presence of the yard. Here we have examined two distinct districts located to the east and west of the city, each displaying a distinct theme, that of maritime trade and industrial activity. However, the map in its entirety captures all aspects of the topographical landscape, all of which are listed in the topographical index of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas volumes. It is quite easy to spend hours perusing the multitudinous laneways, back alleys and courts on this map, and for those who wish to interrogate its contents further, these themes are explored in more detail in the book Dublin 1847, City of the Ordnance Survey, while the Irish Historic Towns Atlas Dublin volumes each contain a large digitised colour reproduction of the entire map. Both publications can be obtained through the Royal Irish Academy website. <laughs>